A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, written by Betty Smith. Chapter 1 Serene was a word you could put to Brooklyn, New York, especially in the summer of 1912. Somber, as a word, was better, but it did not apply to Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Prairie was lovely, and Shenandoah had a beautiful sound, but you couldn't fit those words into Brooklyn. Serene was the only word for it, especially on a Saturday afternoon in summer. Late in the afternoon, the sun slanted down into the mossy yard belonging to Francie Nolan's house and warmed the worn wooden fence. Looking at the shafted sun, Francie had the same fine feeling that came when she recalled the poem they recited in school. This is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks bearded with moss and in garments green, indistinct in the twilight, stand like druids of eld. The one tree in Francie's yard was neither a pine nor a hemlock. It had pointed leaves, which grew along green switches, which radiated from the bough and made a tree which looked like a lot of open green umbrellas. Some people called it the tree of heaven. No matter where its seed fell, it made a tree which struggled to reach the sky. It grew in boarded up lots and out of neglected rubbish heaps, and it was the only tree that grew out of cement. It grew lushly, but only in the tenement districts. You took a walk on a Sunday afternoon and came into a nice neighborhood, very refined. You saw a small one of these trees through the iron gate leading to someone's yard and you knew that soon the section of Brooklyn would get to be a tenement district. The tree knew. It came there first. Afterwards, poor foreigners seeped in, and the quiet old brown stone houses were hacked up into flats. Feather beds were pushed out on the window sills to air, and the tree of heaven flourished. That was the kind of tree it was. It liked poor people. That was the kind of tree in Francie's yard. Its umbrellas curled over, around, and under her third-floor fire escape. An 11-year-old girl sitting on the fire escape could imagine that she was living in a tree. That's what Francine imagined every Sunday afternoon in summer. Oh, what a wonderful day was Saturday in Brooklyn. Oh, how wonderful anywhere. People were paid on Saturday, and it was a holiday without the rigidness of a Sunday. People had money to go out and buy things. They ate well for once, got drunk, had dates, made love, and stayed up until all hours singing, playing music, fighting, and dancing because the morrow was their own free day. They could sleep late, until late mass anyhow. On Sunday, most people crowded into the 11 o'clock mass. Well, some people, a few, went to early 6 o'clock mass. They were given credit for this, but they deserved none, for they were the ones who had stayed out so late that it was morning when they got home. So they went to this early Mass, got it over with, and went home and slept all day with a free conscience. For Francie, Saturday started with a trip to the junkie. She and her brother Neely, like, like other Brooklyn kids, collected rags, paper, metal, rubber, and other junk and hoarded it in a locked cellar bins or in a box hidden under the bed. All week, Francie walked home slowly from school with her eyes in the gutter looking for tinfoil from cigarette packages or chewing gum wrappers. This was melted in the lid of a jar. The junkie wouldn't take an unmelted ball of foil because too many kids put iron washers in the middle to make it way heavier. Sometimes, Neely found a seltzer bottle. Francie helped him break the top off and melt it down for lead. The junkie wouldn't buy a complete top because he'd get into trouble with the soda water people. A seltzer bottle top was fine. Melted it, melted, it was worth a nickel. Francie and Neely went down into the cellar each evening and emptied the dumbwaiter shelves of the day's accumulated trash. They owned this privilege because Francie's mother was the janitress. They looted the shelves of paper, rags, and deposit bottles. Paper wasn't worth much, 
they got only a penny for ten pounds. Rags brought two cents a pound and iron four. Copper was good, ten cents a pound. Sometimes Francie came across the bonanza, the bottom of a discarded washer boiler. She got it off with a can opener, folded it, pounded it, folded it, and pounded it again. Soon after nine o'clock of a Saturday morning, kids be began spraying out of all the sides of the street on Manhattan Avenue, the main thoroughfare. They made their s slow way up the avenue to Skull Street. Some carried their junk in their arms. Others had wagons made of wooden soap boxes with solid wooden wheels. A few pushed loaded baby buggies. Francie and Neely put all their junk into a burlap bag and each grabbed an end and dragged it along the street. Up Manhattan Avenue, past Mauer, Ten Eck, Stag, and Shoal Street. Beautiful names for ugly streets. From each side street, horde of a little ragamuffins emerged to swell the main tide. On the way to Carney's, they met other kids coming back empty-handed. They had sold their junk and already squandered the pennies. Now, swaggering back, they jeered at the other kids. Rag picker, rag picker. Francie's face burned at the name. No comfort knowing that the taunters were rag bickers, too. No matter that her brother would straggle back empty-handed with his gang and taunt latecomers the same way. Francie felt ashamed. Carney plied his junk business in a tumbled-down stable. Turning the corner, Francie saw that both doors were hooked back hospitably, and she imagined that the large, Land dial of the swinging scale blinked a welcome. She saw Carney with his rusty hair, rusty mustache, and rusty eyes presiding at the scale. Carney liked girls better than boys. He would give a girl an extra penny if she did not shrink when he pinched her cheek. Because of the possibility of this bonus, Neely stepped aside and let Francie drag the bag into the stable. Carney jumped forward, dumped the contents of the bag on the floor, and took a preliminary pinch out of the, her cheek. While he plied the stuff onto the scale, Francie blinked, adjusting her eyes to the darkness, and was aware of the mossy air and the odor of wetted rags. Carney slewed his eyes at the dial and spoke two words, his offer. Francie knew that no dickering was permitted. She nodded yes, and Carney flipped the junk off and made her wait while he piled the paper in one corner threw the rags in another, and sorted out the metals. Only then did he reach down in his pants pockets, haul up an old leather pouch tied with wax string, and count out old green pennies that looked like junk too. As she whispered, thank you, Carney fixed a rusty junked look on her and pinched her cheek hard. She stood her ground. He smiled and added an extra penny. Then his manner changed and became loud and brisk. Come on, he hollered to the next one in line, a boy. Get the lad out, he timed the laugh. And I don't mean junk. The children laughed dutifully. The laughter sounded like a bleeding of lost little lambs, but Carney seemed satisfied. Francie went outside to report to her brother. He gave me 16 cents and a pinching penny. That's your penny, he said, according to the old agreement. But she put the penny in her dress pocket and turned the rest of the money over to him. Neely was ten, a year younger than Francie, but he was the boy. He handled the money. He divided the pennies carefully. Eight cents for the bank. That was the rule. Half of the, any money they got from anywhere went into the tin can bank that was nailed to the floor in the darkest corner of the closet. And four cents for you and four cents for me. Francie knotted the bank money in her handkerchief. She looked at her own five pennies, realizing happily that they could be changed into a whole nickel. Neely rolled up the burlap bag, tucked it under his arm, and pushed his way in Cheap Charlie's with Francie right behind him. Cheap Charlie's was the penny candy store next to Carney's, which catered to the junk trade. At the end of a Saturday, its cash box was filled with greenish pennies, but an unwritten law... It was Boy's store, so Francie did not go all the way in. She stood by the doorway. The boys, from 8 to 14 years of age, looked alike in straggling knickerbockers 
and broken peaked caps. They stood around, hands in pockets, and thin shoulders hunched forward tensely. They would grow up looking like that, standing the same way in other hangouts. The only difference would be the cigarette seemingly permanently fastened between the lips, rising and falling in accent as they spoke. Now the boys churned about nervously, their thin faces turning from Charlie to look at each other and back to Charlie again. Francie noticed that some already had their summer hair cut, hair cropped so short that there, there were nicks in the scalp where the clippers had bitten too deeply. These fortunates had their caps crammed into their pockets or pushed back on the head. The unshorn ones, whose hair curled gently and still babyishly at the nape of the neck, were ashamed and wore their caps pulled so far down over their ears that there was something girlish about them in spite of their jerky profanity. Cheap Charlie was not cheap in his name, wasn't Charlie. He had taken that name, and it said so on the store awning, and Francie believed it. Charlie gave you a pick for your penny, a board with fifty numbered hooks and a prize hanging from each hook, hung behind the counter. There were a few fine prizes, roller skates, a catcher's mitt, a doll with real hair, and so on. The other hooks held blotters, pencils, and other penny articles. Francie watched as Neely bought a pick. He removed the dirty card from the ragged envelope. Twenty-six! Hopefully Francie looked at the board. He had drawn a penny pen wiper. Prize or candy, Charlie asked him. Candy, what do you think? It was always the same. Francie had never heard of anyone winning above a penny prize. Indeed, the skate wheels were rusted, and the doll's hair was dust-filmed as though these things had waited there a long time, like little boy Blue's do toy dog and tin soldier. Someday, Francie resolved, when she had fifty cents, she would take all the picks and win everything on the board. She figured that would be a good business deal. Skates, mitt, doll, and other things for fifty cents. Why, the skates alone were worth four times that much. Le Neely would have to come along that great day because girls seldom patronized Charlie's. True, there were a few girls in there that Saturday, bold, brash ones, too developed for their age. Girls who talked loud and horse played around with the boys. Girls from whom neighbors prophesied would come to no good. Francie went across the street to Gippy's candy store. Gimpy was lame. He was a gentle man, kind to little children, or so everyone thought until that sunny afternoon when he inveigled a little girl into his dismal back room. Francie debated whether she should sacrifice one of her pennies for a Gimpy special, the prize bag. Maudie Donovan, her once-in-a-while girlfriend, was about to make a purchase. Francie pushed her way in until she was standing behind Maudie. She pretended that she was spending the penny. She held her breath as Maudie, after much speculation, pointed dramatically at a bulging bag in the showcase. Francie would have picked a smaller bag. She looked over her friend's shoulder, saw her take out a few pieces of stale candy, and examine her prize, a coarse cambric handkerchief. Once Francie had gotten a small bottle of strong scent, she debated again whether to spend a penny on a prize bag. It was nice to be surprised even if you couldn't eat the candy, but she reasoned she had been surprised by being with Maudie when she made her purchase, and that was almost as good. Francie walked up Manhattan Avenue, reading aloud the fine-sounding names of the streets as she passed. Shoals, Miserable, Montrose, and then Johnson Avenue. These last two avenues were where Italians had settled. The district called Jewtown started Siegel Street, took in Moore and McKibben, and went past Broadway. Francine headed for Broadway. And what was on Broadway in Williamsburg, Brooklyn? Nothing. Only the finest nickel and dime store in all the world. It was big and glittery and had everything in the world in it or so it seemed to an 11-year-old. Francie had a nickel. Francie had power. She could practically buy anything in that store. It was the only place in the world where that could be. 
Arriving at the store, she walked up and down the aisles handling any object her fancy favored. What a wonderful feeling to pick something up, hold it for a moment, feel its contour, run her hand over its surface, and then replace it carefully. Her nickel gave her this privilege. If a floor walker asked whether she intended to buy anything, she could say yes, buy it, and show him a thing or two. Money was a wonderful thing, she decided. After an orgy of touching things, she made her planned purchase, five cents worth of pink and white peppermint wafers. She walked back home down Graham Avenue, the ghetto street. She was excited by the filled push carts, each a little store in itself, the bargaining, emotional juice and the peculiar smells of the neighborhood, baked stuffed fish, sour rye bread fresh from the oven, and something that smelled like honey boiling. She stared at the bearded men in their alpaca skull caps and silkaline coats and wondered what made their eyes so small and fierce. She looked into tiny hole-in-the-wall shops and smelled the dress fabrics arranged in disorder on the tables. She noticed the feather beds bellying out of the windows, clothes of oriental bright colors drying on the fire escapes, and the half-naked children playing in the gutters. A woman, big with child, sat patiently at the curb in a stiff wooden chair. She sat in the hot sunshine, watching the life on the street, and guarding within herself her own mystery of life. Francie remembered her surprise that time when Mama told her that Jesus was a Jew. Francie had thought that he was a Catholic, but Mama knew. Mama said the Jews had never looked on Jesus as anything but a troublesome Yiddish boy who would not work at the carpentry trade, marry, settle down, and raise a family. And the Jew Jews believed that their Messiah was yet to come, Mama said. Thinking of this, Francie stared at the pregnant Jewess. I guess that's why the Jews have so many babies, Francie thought, and why they sit so quiet, waiting, and why they aren't ashamed the way they are fat. Each one thinks that she might be making the real little Jesus. Now, why they walk so proud when they're that way? Now, the Irish women always look so ashamed. They know that they can never make a Jesus. It will be just another Mick. When I grow up and know that I'm going to have a baby, I will remember to walk proud and slow, even though I'm not a Jew. It was 12 when Francie got home. Mama came in soon after her, with her broom and a pail, which she banged into a corner with that final bang, which meant that they wouldn't be touched again until Monday. Mama was 29. She had black hair and brown eyes and was quick with her hands. She had a nice shape, too. She worked as a janitress and kept three tenement houses clean. Who would ever believe that Mama scrubbed floors to make a living for the four of them? She was so pretty and slight and vivid and always bubbling over with intensity and fun. Even though her hands were red and cracked from the soda water, they were beautifully shaped with lovely curved oval nails. Everyone said it was pity that a slight pretty woman like Katie Nolan had to go and scrubbing floors. But what else could she do considering the husband she had, they said. They admitted that no matter which way you looked at it, Johnny Nolan was a handsome, lovable fellow, far superior to any man on the block. But he was a drunk. That's what they said, and it was true. Francie made Mama watch while she put the eight cents in the tin can bank. They had a pleasant five minutes conjecturing about how much was in the bank. Francie thought there must be nearly a hundred dollars. Mama said eight dollars would be nearer right. Mama gave Francine instructions about going out to buy something for lunch. Take eight cents from the cracked cup and get a quarter loaf of Jew rye bread and see that it's fresh. Then take a nickel, go to Sour Wines, and ask for the end of the tongue for a nickel. But you have to have a pool with him to get it. Tell him that your mama said, insisted Katie firmly. She thought something over. I wonder whether we ought to buy five cents worth of sugar buns or put that money in the bank. Oh, mama, it's Saturday. All week you said we could have dessert on Saturday. All right, get the buns. 
The little Jewish delicatessen was full of Christians buying Jew rye bread. She watched the man push her quarter loaf into a paper bag. With its wonderful, crisp, yet tender crust of floury bottom, it was easily the most wonderful bread in the world, she thought, when it was fresh. She entered Sourwin's store reluctantly. Sometimes he was agreeable about the tongue, and sometimes he wasn't. Sliced tongue at 75 cents a pound was only for the rich people, but when it was nearly all sold, you could get the tongue in for a nickel if you had a pull with Mr. Sourwin. Of course, there wasn't much tongue on to the end. It was mostly soft, small bones and gristle with only the memory of meat. It happened to be one of Sourwin's agreeable day. The tongue came to an end yesterday, he told Francine, but I saved it for you because I know your mama likes tongue, and I like your mama. You tell, you tell her that here? Yes, sir, whispered Francine. She looked down on the floor as she felt her face getting warm. She hated Mr. Sourwin and would not tell Mama what he had said. At the baker's, she picked out four buns, carefully choosing the one, ones with most sugar. She met Neely outside the store. He peeped into the bag and cut a caper of delight when he saw the buns. Although he had eaten four cents worth of candy that morning, he was very hungry and made Francie run all the way home. Papa did not come home for dinner. He was a freelance singer-waiter, which meant that he didn't work very often. Usually he spent Saturday morning at Union headquarters waiting for a job to come in for him. Francie, Neely, and Mama had a very fine meal. Each had a thick slice of the tongue, two pieces of sweet-smelling rye bread spread with unsalted butter, a sugar bun apiece, and a mug of strong hot coffee with a teaspoon of sweetened condensed milk on the side. There was a special Nolan idea about the coffee. It was their one great luxury. Mama made a big pot full each morning and reheated it for dinner and supper, and it got stronger as the day wore on. It was an awful lot of water and very little coffee, but Mama put a lump, lump of chicory in it which made it taste strong and bitter. Each one was allowed three cups a day with milk. Other times you could help yourself to a cup of black coffee anytime you felt like it. Sometimes when you had nothing at all and it was raining and you were alone in the flat, it was wonderful to know that you could have something even though it was only a cup full of black and bitter coffee. Neely and Francie loved coffee but seldom drank it. Today, as usual, Neely let his coffee stand black and ate his condensed milk spread on bread. He sifted a little of the black coffee for the sake of formality. Mama poured out Francie's coffee and put the milk in it, even though she knew that the child wouldn't drink it. Francie loved the smell of coffee and the way it was hot. As she ate her bread and meat, she kept one hand curved about the cup, enjoying its warmth. From time to time, she smelled the bitter sweetness of it. That was better than drinking it. At the end of the meal, it went down the sink. Mama had two sisters, Sissy and Evie, who came to the flat often. Every time they saw the coffee thrown away, they gave Mama a lecture about wasting things. Mama explained, Francie is entitled to one cup each meal like the rest. If it makes her feel better to throw it away rather than drink it, all right, I think it's good that people like us can waste something once in a while and get the feeling of how it be would be to have lots of money and not have to worry about scrounging. This queer point of view satisfied Mama and pleased Francie. It was one of the links between the ground down poor and the wasteful rich. The girl felt that even if she had less than anybody in Williamsburg, somehow she had more. She was richer because she had something to waste. She ate her sugar bun slowly, reluctant to have done with its sweet taste, while the coffee got ice cold. Regally, she poured it down the sink drain, feeling casually extravagant. After that, she was ready to go to Losher's for the family semi-weekly supply of stale bread. Mama told her that she could take a nickel 
and buy a stale pie if she could get one that wasn't too mashed. Locher's Bread fa Factory supplied the neighborhood stores. The bread was not wrapped in wax paper and grew stale quickly. Locher's redeemed the stale bread from the dealers and sold it at half price to the poor. The outlet store joined the bakery. Its long, narrow counter filled one side and long, narrow benches ran along the other two sides. A huge double door opened behind the counter. The bakery wagons backed up to it and unloaded the bread right onto the counter. They sold two loaves for a nickel, and when it was dumped out, the pushing crowd fought for the privilege of buying it. But there was never enough bread, and some waited until three or four wagons had reported before they could buy bread. At that price, the customers had to supply their own wrappings. Most of the purchasers were children. Some kids tucked the bread under their arms and walked home, brazenly letting all the world know that they were poor. The proud ones wrapped the, up the bread in some old newspapers, others in clean or dirty flour sacks. Francie brought along a large paper bag. She didn't try to get her bread right away. She sat on a bench and watched. A dozen kids pushed and shouted at the counter. Four old men dozed on the opposite bench. The old men, pensioners on their families, were made to run errands and mine babies, the only work left for old worn-out men in Williamsburg. They waited as long as they could before buying because Locher smelled kindly of baking bread and the sun coming in the windows felt good on their old backs. They sat and dozed while the hours passed and felt that they were filling up time. The waiting gave them purpose in their life for a little while and almost they felt necessary again. Francie stared at the oldest man. She played her favorite game, figuring out about people. His thin, tangled hair was the same dirty gray as the stubble standing on his sunken cheeks. Dried spittle caked at the corner of his mouth. He yawned. He had no teeth. She watched, fascinated, and revolted as he closed his mouth, drew his lips inward until there was no mouth, and made his chin come up almost to meet his nose. He studied his old coat with the padding hanging out of the torn seams. His legs were sprawled wide in helpless relaxation, and one of the buttons was missing from his grease cake pant opening. She saw that his shoes were battered and broken open at the toes. One shoe was laced with a much-knotted shoestring, and the other with a bit of dirty twine. She saw two thick, dirty toes with creased gray toenails. Her thoughts ran. He is old. He must be past 70. He was born about the time Abraham Lincoln was living and getting himself ready to be president. Williamsburg must have had been a little country place then, and maybe Indians were still living in Flatbush. That was so long ago. She kept staring at his feet. He was a baby once. He must have been sweet and clean, and his mother kissed him in, on his little pink toes. Maybe when it thundered at night, she came to his crib and fixed his blanket better and whispered that he mustn't be afraid. That mother was there. Then she picked him up and put her cheek on his head and said that he was her own sweet baby. He might have been a boy like my brother, running in and out of the house and slamming the door. And while his mother scolded him, she was thinking that maybe he'll be president someday. Then he was a young man, strong and happy. When he walked down the street, the girl smiled and turned to watch him. He smiled back and maybe he winked at the prettiest one. I guess he must have married and had children and they thought he was the most wonderful papa in the world the way he worked hard and brought them toys for Christmas. Now his children were getting old too, like him, and they have children and nobody wants the old man anymore and they're waiting for him to die, but he don't want to die. He wants to keep on living, though he's so old and there's nothing to be happy about anymore. The place was quiet. The summer sun streamed in and made dusty, down slanting roads from the window to the floor. A big green fly buzzed in and out of the sunny dust, ex accepting for herself and the dozing old men 
the place was empty. The children who waited for bread had gone to play outside. Their high screaming voices seemed to come from far away. Suddenly, Francie jumped up. Her heart was beating fast. She was frightened for no reason at all. She thought of an accordion pull out for a rich note. Then she saw an idea that the accordion was closing, closing, closing. A terrible panic that had no name came over her as she realized that many of the sweet babies in the world were born to come to something like this old man someday. She had to get out of that place or it would happen to her. Suddenly, she would be an old woman with toothless gums and feet that disgusted people. At that moment, the double doors behind the counter were banged open as the bread, bread truck backed up. A man came to stand behind the counter. The truck driver started throwing bread to him, which he piled up on the counter. The kids in the street who had heard the doors thrown open piled in and milled around Francie, who had already reached the counter. I want bread, Francie called out. A big girl gave her a strong shove and wanted to know who she thought she was. Never mind, never mind, Francie told her. I want six loaves and a pie not too crushed, she screamed out. Impressed by her intensity, the counterman shoved six loaves and the least battered of the rejected pies at her and took her two dimes. She pushed her way out of the crowd, dropping a loaf which she had trouble picking up as there was no room to stoop over in. Outside, she sat at the curb, fitting the bread and the pie into the paper bag. A woman passed, wheeling a baby in a buggy. The baby was waving his feet in the air. Francie looked and saw not the baby's foot, but the grotesque thing in a big, worn-out shoe. The panic came on her again, and she ran all the way home. The flat was empty. Mama had dressed and gone off with Aunt Sissy to see a matinee from a ten-cent gallery seat. Francie put the bread and the pie away and folded the bag neatly to be used the next time. She went into the tiny windowless bedroom that she shared with Neely and sat on her own cot in the dark, waiting for the waves of panic to stop passing over her. After a while, Neely came in, crawling under his cot and pulled out a ragged catcher's mitt. Where are you going? she asked. Play ball in the lots. Can I come along? No. She followed him down the street. Three of his gang were waiting for him. One had a bat, another a baseball, and the third had nothing but wore a pair of baseball pants. They started out for an empty lot over toward Greenpoint. Neely saw Francie following but said nothing. One of the boys nudged him and said, Hey, your sister's following us. Yeah, agreed Neely. The boy turned around and yelled at Francie. Go chase yourself. It's a free country, Francie stated. It's a free country, Neely reported, repeated to the boy. They took no notice in Francie after that. She continued to follow them. She had nothing to do until two o'clock when the neighborhood library opened again. It was a slow horse playing walk. The boys stopped to look for tin foil in the gutter and to pick up cigarette butts, which they would save and smoke in the cellar on the next rainy day. They took time out of Bedevil and a little Jew boy on his way to Temple. They detained him while they debated what to do with him. The boy waited, smiling humbly. The Christians released him finally with the detailed instructions as his course of conduct for the coming week. Don't show your puss on DeVoe Street, he was ordered. I won't, he promised. The boys were disappointed. They had expected more fight. One of them took out a bit of chalk from his pocket and drew a wavy line on the sidewalk. He commanded, Don't you ever step over that line. The little boy, knowing he had offered them by giving in too easily, decided to play their way. Can I even put one foot in the gutter, fellers? You can't even spit in the gutter, gutter he was told. <sighs> All right, he sighed in pretended resignation. One of the bigger boys had an inspiration. And keep away from Christian girls. Get me? They walked away, leaving him staring after them. Golly, he whispered, rolling his big brown Jewish eyes. The idea is that them, those Goyim thought him man enough to be capable of thinking about any girl 
Gentile or Jew, staggering him, and he went on his way saying, Golly, over and over. The boys walked on slowly, looking slyly at the big boy who had made the remark about the girls and wondered whether he would lead off into a dirty talk session. But before this could start, Francie heard her brother say, I know that kid. He's a white Jew. Neely had heard Papa speak so of a Jewish bartender that he liked. They ain't no such thing as a white Jew, said the big boy. Well, if there was such a thing as a white Jew, said Neely with the, that combination of agreeing with others and still sticking to his own opinion, which made him so amiable, he would be it. There never could be a white Jew, said the big boy, even in supposing. Our Lord was a Jew, Neely was quoting Mama. And other Jews turned right around and killed him, clinched the big boy. Before they could go deeper in theology, they saw a little boy turn into an Ansley Street and Humboldt Street, carrying a basket on his arm. The basket was covered with clean ragged cloth. A stick stuck up from one corner of the basket, and on it, like a sluggish flag, stood six pretzels. The big boy of Neely's gang gave a command, and they made tightly packed run on the pretzel cellar. He stood his ground, opened his mouth, and bawled, Mama! A second-story window flew open, and a woman clutching a crepe paperish kimono around her sprawling breast yelled out, Leave him alone and get off this block, you lousy bastards. Francie hand flew to cover her ears so that the, at confession she would not have to tell the priest that she stood and listened to a bad word. We ain't doing nothing, lady, said Neely, with that ingrating smile, which always went over his mother. You bet your life you ain't. Not while I'm around. Then without changing her tone, she called to her son. And get upstairs here, you. I'll learn you to bother me when I'm taking a nap. The pretzel boy went upstairs and the gang ambled on. That lady's tough, the big boy jerked his head back at the window. Yeah, the others agreed. My old man's tough, offered a smaller boy. Who the hell cares, inquired the big boy languid languidly. I was just saying, apologized the smaller boy. My old man ain't tough, said Neely. The boys laughed. They ambled along, stopping now and then to breathe deeply of the smell of Newton Creek, which flowed its narrow, tormented way a few blocks up Grand Street. Gosh, she stinks, commanded the big boy. Yeah, Neely sounded deeply satisfied. I bet that's the worst stink in the world, bragged another boy. Yeah. And Francie whispered, yeah, in agreement. She was proud of that smell. It let her know that nearby was a waterway, which, dirty though it was, joined a river that flowed out to the sea. To her, the stupendous stench suggested far-sailing ships and adventure, and she was pleased with the smell. Just as the boys reached the lot, in which there was a ragged diamond trampled out, the little yellow butterfly flew across the weeds. With man's instinct to capture anything running, flying, swimming, or crawling, they gave chase, throwing their ragged caps at it in advance of their coming. Neely caught it. The boys looked at it briefly, quickly lost interest in it, and started up a four-man baseball game of their own devising. They played furiously, cursing, sweating, and punching each other. Every time a stumble bum passed and loitered for a moment, they clowned and showed off. There was a rumor that the Brooklyn's had a hundred scouts roaming the streets of a Saturday afternoon, watching lots of games and spotting promising players. And there wasn't a Brooklyn boy who wouldn't rather play on the Brooklyn team than be president of the United States. After a while, Francie got tired of watching them. She knew that they would play and fight and show off until it was time to drift home for supper. It was two o'clock. The librarian should be back from lunch by now. With pleasant anticipation, Francie walked back towards the library.